Thank God for those of you who are listening by way uh, that are in prison or that are behind prison walls. We thank the Lord that you're taking the time to sit and listen with us this morning. Um, Pastor Clark is away. He's on vacation, uh, much needed vacation. He and Cindy. And I do have a message from him I do want to share. Now, first of all, yesterday, Cindy's mother, I don't know if you, how many know about it, but Cindy's mother, <clears throat> Alice, she actually fell yesterday. And I think she's down there on vacation with them. But anyway, she fell yesterday, and they believe that she broke um, either her femur. I believe she broke her femur. And um, today, she's actually going to be having surgery on that femur uh, sometime this afternoon. So we're definitely asking for prayers for that as well. Um, in addition to that, Clark gave us some really, really good news. We have been talking about the new radio station that would be a lot bigger and that it would reach more people. And I got a message, really an encouraging message from Clark this morning that shared this. This translator that we were looking to, they were looking to purchase, which can actually reach up to another on top of what we're reaching now, another 600,000 people on top of the Grace FM. That price initially, and this is how we know that God is working in this, that price initially, they were asking for $875,000 to purchase that station. But now, they're only down, they're only asking for $350,000. So the Lord is moving. Um, if anybody's interested in being a part of acquiring this radio station or joining with us and partnering with us and helping to give donation, uh, please see Clark. Reach out to Clark about that because he would be able to give you direction on how to best do that. Reach out to him, and if you have any questions about it, he would actually be the one to answer uh, any uh, technical questions that you have concerning the station as well. It's very timely at this particular point as we are trying to get the word out to further borders, to further our borders and, and our reach to get the word of God out. So it's very timely. This will actually reach us into Pittsburgh, which is something else that we've had a heart to do, to be able to reach Pittsburgh with verse by verse, chapter by chapter teaching. So this would be a real blessing. We, it appears that God is in it. We're going to continue to pray, obviously and to um, receive God's leading and direction on this because we don't want to move ahead of him. We want to know that he's in this before we would do something like that. And I thank God for um, Pastor Clark, the, mis the visionary that he is, uh, to be able to see beyond what we are reaching now and always praying and looking for how we could further reach more people with the gospel, which is what we all should be doing, is looking to see how God can use us, each and every one of us. It doesn't matter how old or how young we are. We should be looking to see how can God use us to reach more people with the gospel. That's why he gave it to us. That's why we have it. We've been blessed to be able to understand. Your eyes, all of our eyes have been open with the gospel, the gospel truth. And we may take it for granted and think, well, everybody knows it, just that some people are listening to it, some people not. That's not necessarily true. There's some people who don't know this. They don't know about the gospel message. And if you want to test that, just when you're walking the street sometimes, just, you know, stop and ask somebody and just talk to them and ask them what they know about Jesus Christ. And you'll find out very quickly that not many people really know about who Jesus Christ is. So he's given it to us. He's allowed us to be able to know this. He's opened our eyes to the truth. And we are to go out, as he told us in the Great Commission, right, to go out and to teach others and to make disciples of others and teach them to observe all the things that he commanded. Now, that's not the message. I just was, that was just an introduction to what we're going to be talking about somewhat. But I, I think that it's incumbent upon us to allow ourselves to be used in that way. So we thank God that he's given us an opportunity through this opportunity for this radio station to reach another 600,000 people. It's amazing. It's amazing. So thank God for that. And thank God for Clark and Cindy. I pray that they are getting an opportunity to rest 
I pray that they will come back refreshed, and uh, we look forward to seeing them whenever they do get back. But take your time, enjoy your time away. You deserved it. Well-deserved vacation. Why don't we pray, and then we're going to get into the Word of God. Amen. Before we do that also, I want to just uh, encourage uh, the men, if you have not registered yet for the men's conference that's coming up uh, next month, I pray that you would uh, look to do that. There's information in the back on that, and I know that there are announcements that have come out by email as well. Um, If you have any questions about how to do that, you can see Karen or Clark or myself about registering for the men's conference, and I encourage you women to um, register for the women's conference. It's always good when men and women can get away um, and to study the word of God and to have fellowship, women with women and men with men. Uh, It's a blessing. So I want to encourage you all to do that. Let's pray. Father, it always amazes me when we have an opportunity to stand or to sit and to hear your heart. Lord, you are the creator of both heaven and earth. You're the highest authority anywhere. You're everlasting. You're alpha and you're omega. You're all wise. You're all knowing. You're all powerful. You're all seeing. There's nothing that escapes you. There's no one wiser, and there's no one mightier. You are the true and living God. And this morning, Lord, we're sitting in awe of you. We worship you with song and praise. And now we have an opportunity to worship you by sitting and listening to your word. The very word, Father, that you spoke as all scripture, all scripture is inspired by you. Father, help us to take this Not as a word that's coming from some man, but as it is indeed the word of God. Help us to hear it, but even more important, help us to obey it. That we receive it in our hearts, Lord, and we respond the way that you tell us in your word. So Holy Spirit, please come and manifest yourself among each and every one of us. Help us to hear this word. Help us to heed to this word. Reveal your truth to us, Lord. You said that the secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed belongs to us and to our children. Father, reveal this truth to us. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us to be able to come under the authority of them of it and to be able to obey it in Jesus name we pray amen usually I like to read the entire length or the text of what it is that we're going to be covering but today because of the the abundance of truth that's in these verses I like to bite this elephant, if we could, with smaller bites and take time and go through it verse by verse, as we always do, but even reading it and sharing the understanding of it or sharing the insight. I like to do it line by line, verse by verse, for the most part. This is John, as we talked about a couple weeks ago. John is the apostle that he himself called the apostle of love. And as we read further in this particular chapter, we're going to see why he calls himself the apostle of love because I think John talks the apostle John talks more about love than any of the other apostles do in any of the other gospels or epistles. He had a love that he understood 
the love of Jesus just in a different way than the others did. It's not that the others didn't understand that Jesus loved them, but John's heart was a little bit more, was a little softer, was a little bit more uh, knitted to the love of Jesus Christ. And he emphasized that more than what the other apostles did. It's interesting because John was one of the youngest apostles, but at the same time, at this particular time, he is now one of the oldest. In fact, he's at this particular time, he's actually the only one who is still remaining. John was never martyred. John died of old age, if you remember. Now, the other, all the other apostles died from being martyred, but not John. John died of old age. It's not that it wasn't attempted. There was many attempts on his life to martyr him and to, and to, and to kill him, but the Lord had another purpose for John, and he kept him through those things. I'm a strong believer that none of us are going to leave here until we've accomplished all that the Lord wants us to accomplish anyway. I believe until that time, we're immortal until the Lord says, no, I'm ready for you to come home. <laughs> but John understood that there was a message that he needs to bring to the church at this particular time because of what was going on. And I'm amazed at how timely that message is versus where we are today. This could have walked out of the pages out of the day, out of today's meeting. I mean, it could walk right out of the day's events, what John is teaching in this particular message. It's a hard truth, and I believe that John does this for a reason, not for shock purposes or anything like that, but he wants to be as direct as possible because the Lord is being direct as possible through him as we go through these scriptures. And this is a message, keep in mind, this is a message to the church. So he's talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's not talking to Gentiles. He's talking to believers. He's talking to those who trust in Jesus Christ. He's talking to the church. And he says some very pointed and interesting things. So as we look at the first verse, it says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. What? Wait, wait a minute. So that you may not sin. I, I sin. <laughs> we, we sin. We're believers, and yet we sin, don't we? We, we, we? we still do things that are contrary to God's word sometimes. John is talking about practicing sin. He's talking about sin that you don't sin as in being a lifestyle, participating in a lifestyle of sin. That sin characterizes who you are. If someone says, what do you know about Lewis? Oh, he's a sinner. Every time I see him, he's doing something. Either he's drunk or he's, you know, uh, participating in some immorality. Well, that's, about, that's a practice of sin. But as believers, we do sin. John told us that, didn't he, over in chapter 1? If you go back to uh, chapter 1 and you look at verse 10, he says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. What he is saying here, if we say that we don't sin at all, if we deny all sin, that we never sin, then he's saying that we're making God a liar. And that's true because God himself said in the book of Romans through Paul, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Have sinned in the past, fall short in the present of the glory of God. And we do. If we're honest with ourselves, every day we're looking at confessing some sin. And he even tells us that there's a there's something put in place for us as believers if we do sin. And that thing that's put in place is up here in, in, in chapter 1, verse, um, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we do sin. But what John is talking about here is that when we sin as believers, we can confess it. In fact, we are moved to confess it because of the Holy Spirit that's in us. We're moved to confess it. Our prayer should be, Lord, please, if I sin, or when I, not if, but when I sin, Lord, convict my heart 
So I'll come running to the throne of God and ask for his mercy, for his forgiveness, for his grace in my sin. We should mourn that sin because we know, regardless of how big or how small that sin is, it breaks the heart of God. It's contrary to who he is and who he's calling us to be. But in our weakness, sometimes we will sin. The issue is not whether or not we will, but the issue is how do we respond when we do? And this is exactly what he's talking about here. If we confess it, believers should be confessors. (laughs) We should be consistent confessors because of the Holy Spirit that's in us. So when he says here, you know, I write to you, little children, So that you may not sin. He's saying so that you may not practice this sin. That you may not use, that that sin may not be your lifestyle. Because at this particular time, and even now sometimes, people were teaching and preaching that it was okay to sin. The Gnostics believed that, look, your relationship with the Lord all deals, you know, with your knowledge of who he is. That's your relationship with him. It's who your knowledge, your knowledge of him. If you believe then you're fine. What you do with your body is something totally different because God don't deal with you on the basis of what you do through your body because that's matter. And see, and the Gnostics believed that matter was all evil. Your body was evil. So what you did with your body, that has nothing to do with what you believe. That's air. It's air. But the problem is, is that even now in the church, sin has been taken very casual. Things that the Word of God tells us to not participate in, a lot of times now people were really believing that it's okay to participate in some of those things. The church, you know, as a whole, the church has seen that there's a difference, and we're struggling with the difference between obedience to God's Word or seeing obedience as works. And that's not what he's talking about here. But this is a struggle that we have here in the church. Obedience versus the legalistic view of works for salvation. In fact, A.W. Tozer said this. The church of our day has soft-pedaled the doctrine of obedience, either neglecting it altogether or mentioning it only apologetically and without urgency. This results in a fundamental confusion of obedience with works in the minds of preacher and people. Salvation by work, right here. To escape the error of salvation by works, we have fallen into the opposite error, which is of salvation without obedience. Mm. Fallen into the opposite. To escape the error of salvation by works, we have fallen into the opposite error of salvation without obedience. In our eagerness to get rid of the legalistic doctrine of works, we have thrown out the baby with the bath and gotten rid of obedience as well. As the people of God, one of the things that indicates that we are of the children of God, is our obedience to the command of God. Walking in obedience to God. But sin has become very casual in the church. The church has become very, very casual in sin. So so, so, uh, I've read some surveys recently that said that the the mind of the church has kind of changed when it comes to casual sex now or living with someone. Sexual immorality of all types. It's changed on that. If you love somebody, then it's okay that you have sex with them. As long as you love them. And also, even when it comes to drinking, you know, I mean, there's more Christians that are drinking today. And I'm not talking about having a glass of wine with dinner. (laughs) I'm talking about drinking and having it affect the way that we live or the, the frequency in which those who are in the church are drinking, swearing. 
No one has an issue, or I should say in the church, it, 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 it's not seen the way it used to be seen as a sin to have filthy language come out of our mouths. But they think some swear words are okay. Unforgiveness. We don't mind holding on to grudges longer in the church because we feel, you know, a lot of us feel that, hey, I'm justified by feeling this. You don't know what that person did. The Bible says forgive. We have to walk in forgiveness the way we were forgiven by God. Hatred, which we're going to get into a lot more a little later, but hatred, hatred in the church. Now, we experienced hatred before when we were in the world. We experienced people who hated. We experienced either hating ourselves or being hated in the church. But now we experience it in the church as well. People hate. And that can be very, very dangerous because these are matters of the heart. But yet we are called to obey. Just want to read a couple of scriptures that justify the fact that we are called to obey. The first one I'm going to go to is back in the Romans. This is Paul talking about obeying the gospel. And he says this back in Romans chapter 1, verse 5. He says, through him, meaning Jesus Christ, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among the nations. In other words, he is saying that as an apostle, we are to go out and teach people to obey the gospel, which is what we all should be doing as, as teachers or preachers or, 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 or even just believers. We are to teach obedience to the gospel, not just believing the gospel, but having obedience to it. And then if we just go over to chapter 6, if we just go over to chapter 6, we see this over in verse 17 and 18. It says, but, but God be thanked that through you, that though you were slaves to sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And we also know that over in 2 Thessalonians, Paul had a very strong message about those who don't obey. 2 Thessalonians, he says this. Back in chapter 1, in verse 8, he says this. He's talking about judgment here. And he says, in flaming fire, Taking vengeance on those who do not know God, who do not, do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But when we look at it, that shouldn't be any shock to us. Because if we go back to the Great Commission, which was delivered to us, if you look at it back in Matthew. And I love looking at Matthew because Matthew gives us a very clear picture, very straightforward picture of what the Great Commission actually entailed. And he says this, the first thing we are to do is go. He says, go therefore, I'm looking at Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 19. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And this is the one right here in verse 20. Listen to what he says teaching them to observe. That means teaching them to obey, teaching them to keep all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we have been commanded. We have been encouraged. And throughout the authority of the script, throughout the scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, uh, coming under the authority of the scriptures is important. It doesn't matter how much we hear the word of God. How much do we obey? What do we walk in? What does our life dictate? You see, faith is not divorce from obedience, but it is divorce from works for the law, for righteousness. We can't earn 
righteousness through trying to keep the law. We can't earn salvation through trying to keep the law. And we don't walk in obedience in order to try to be saved. We walk in obedience because we are saved. It's the indication that we do belong to the Lord because we obey him. That's why we walk in obedience. True faith leads to obedience. In Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, Jesus, <laughs> the, the, the scripture says that Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. To all who obey him. True faith and obedience, they go together. When Jesus came, when it says over in John chapter 1, when John says, in John chapter 1, verse 14, he says, and the word became flesh. The word of God, Jesus Christ, the word of God became flesh. It became a man that we could see. It became a man that we could observe. It became a man that we could, that example of God's word that we could follow behind. It became flesh. Well, in us as believers, the word of God should become flesh. It should become flesh in us. We should be those who obey the word of God. People should, who are not believers should be able to see something about the character of God by seeing us. They should see something about the word of God by seeing us. The word should become flesh in each and every one of us. And that's my prayer, that as a church, that the word becomes flesh in us, not just something that we read on the pages. We get up in the morning and we do our devotions and we read these things, and we get these, these highlights. We get these, these, these revelations. We, we get these, these, these glimpses at truth, and, and we meditate on these things all day long, and we can quote them. We can quote them and tell you what they are and share it with somebody else. But the powerful part of our relationship with him is not how much of his word we remember. It's how much of his word do we live. What are we walking out what are we seeing? What are people seeing in us? What are people seeing in us? So the word should be flesh in us. <laughs> we could go on and on with this because it's so important that we understand how necessary it is to not only just hear the word of God, but to be doers and obey the word of God. And this is what John is saying to us, that you may not sin, that you may not practice sin. Don't let that be the category of your lifestyle. And it says, and if anyone sins, and it can better be rendered, and we assume that all do, <laughs> it could probably be written, it probably could be read this way, and when anyone sins. Listen what it says, and this is why. Jesus Christ is so important to us. He says that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have an advocate with the Father. We were told back in John 14 that when Jesus said, look, when I go away, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you another helper. I'm going to send you an advocate. And that word, when you study that out, one of the words for that helper is, is advocate, the parakletos. It's the advocate. It's the one who comes alongside you. He says, I'm going to send you an advocate. I'm going to send you a helper. And he's going to come alongside and he's going to help you. He's going to teach you all things. He's going to tell you all things. He's going to remind you of the things that I said to you. He's going to come and judge the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. All these things is what the helper is going to come to do. And he helps us here on earth, that helper. He helps us here on earth. But in the heavens, we also have an advocate. And that advocate is Jesus Christ. That advocate is Jesus Christ in the heavens, advocating for us. Now, we know that here in the earth that an advocate is like, uh, you know, it, you know he's, not your, he's not our defense attorney in heaven. That's not what we're talking about. He's an advocate. You see, here we have advocates that protect people. They stand up with people in court, right? And the advocate is basically that person that tries to get you off, that, uh, that attorney, right? That, you know, uh, he, he tries to get you off, 
off of a course, off of a case, or, you know, a, a, a criminal accusation that was made against you. He tries to get you off on that. Jesus is not that kind of an advocate. Jesus don't come into court saying he's innocent. No, Jesus said, yeah, he's guilty. He did it. He did it. And we should be confessing it. We shouldn't be standing back saying we're not guilty. Yes, we are guilty. We are guilty of all those. In fact, we're guilty of much more than what we actually confess sometimes. Jesus, as an advocate, because he's a righteous advocate, said, yes, he's guilty. He did that. But I died for that. That debt is paid. And it's paid in full. What a blessing to have an advocate. That advocate is a helper, is one who pleads a case for someone else or on someone else's behalf. He's also an advisor. See, the advocate also is one who advises us, who advises us and, and speaks to us and gives us truth. The Holy Spirit is an advocate and Jesus is the advocate that we have with the Father. One who speaks in our, in our behalf. I thank God that we have a righteous advocate in heaven. And this advocate is always making intercession for our sins. Romans 8 and 34 talks about the fact that Christ makes intercession for us. So who is it that can condemn us? Who condemns us? It's Christ who died for us. And he also rose again. And he's with the Father. And he's making intercession for us. That's his resurrected ministry. Also talks about being an advocate over in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. He says that, you know, he, he, he says to the uttermost, <laughs> to the uttermost, all those who come to him, who come to God through Jesus Christ. For he ever lives ever lives, not like the Old Testament high priest who used to die off and then somebody else had to take their place. And then that one advocates for us or, or presents the offering for us. But no, Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. He's the eternal. He's the eternal advocate. He's the eternal one who works on our behalf. Thank God. Jesus alone is the righteous one. In his resurrected ministry, he intercedes for us on our behalf. Can't wait to see him when he comes back. Can't wait to see him. But then in chapter, in verse 2, he gives us another ministry that Jesus, that Jesus has done for us. This is all about Jesus. Jesus is our advocate with the Father. Jesus is the righteous and Jesus himself is, our, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He's our propitiation. So you see, Jesus Christ is the one. He didn't just appease. And sometimes if you look for a definition for propitiation, sometimes you'll see the word appease. I don't particularly care for that definition because appease is not just what he did. It just doesn't give a, a full picture of everything he did. See, I can, you know, we can appease someone by just giving a little bit. You know, my mother, she, my grandmother, I used to hang out with her when, she, when I was younger. And my grandmother, like, when she would go pay her bills and things like that, and she never made a whole lot of money. So, you know, I mean, she could never, like, pay things in full. You know, she'd have to give a bit here, a bit there. And back at that time, you know, if you just showed, because everything was on an honor system back in those days, right? You know, if you just showed that you were, uh, re, you know, being responsible or that you really have a heart to pay the debt, people gave you leniency, right? And you, you had a little bit more breath and more, more time to pay it. And, and my grandmother would always go and just give what she could. Like I said, she didn't make much money, but she would give what she could. She would always show, and she always taught me to always show that you are making an effort at least. If you do, if you just show that you're making an effort, people will kind of leave you alone. The creditors will kind of leave you alone. So I give them a little bit. Of, she, she says, I give them a little bit of hush money. <laughs> Grandmama, what, what, what's hush money? Hush money so that they'll hush. And <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they won't be calling all the time, you know, or sending me letters all the time. They'll hush. They'll hush. Give them a little bit of hush money. And when I get it, they'll get it. So, yeah, she, she taught me that when I was very young. 
But that's not what Jesus did. He didn't give God hush money for us. He satisfied the entire debt. <laughs> Jesus satisfied the entire debt. It's paid in full. We don't owe anything. Else. He satisfied it. It wasn't just hush money. He gave himself and paid the entire debt. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And not only just for us, but what he gave was enough to satisfy the sin debt for the whole world. And I just want to say to those, if there's anyone here who have not given their hearts to Christ, have not trusted in Christ, the work has already been done. The debt, all you have to do, already been paid for you. All you have to do is believe on the one who paid the debt. Trust in the one who paid the debt. Now, he's not saying universal. Don't think that John is talking about universalism here or talking about inclusion theology. He's not. He's not saying, oh, well, then how some people preach is, oh, well, then we're all saved and ain't nobody going to hell then. God saved everybody. Look, it says right here he paid it all for everybody, the whole world. He paid it for the whole world, but only those who believe will have salvation. And how many times do we hear that in the scripture? When he said he came to his own, his own received him not, but as many as received him, he gave power to become the sons or the children of God. It's only those who believe that have the eternal life. It's not everybody. So if you want eternal life, trust in him, believe on him, know who he is, develop a relationship with him. Salvation is through faith. When we trust in him by grace through faith. So when we trust in him, then we have the benefit of what he did for us on the cross. Amen. So now he says here, he says, OK, now by this, we know that we know him. Now we're going into the test of who he is. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. This is a consistent thing, that obedience. Because there's a lot of people who claim, I know Jesus, I know Jesus, I know Jesus. You can meet 25 people a day and I bet 10 of them will say that they know Jesus. But then we observe the life. And we don't see the indication. We don't see evidence of it. And in this house, we want for people, not for anybody who would observe us, to know that, yes, they know Jesus. They know Jesus because of how we live. Let that be named among us. How do we live? We don't know him just because they, 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 they know his name or just because they know what he says in his word, but we know them because look how they live. Look how you live. Look how you walk. That's how people will know. And he says here, if we keep his commandments, that's how we know that we know him. He who says, now this is about to start to deal, John is about to start to deal with three false claims here. And they all will start with he who says. The first claim, he says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. My goodness, John. My goodness. Honest, I'm not saying it. It's in here. I'm not calling you a liar. It's in here. John is saying this. It's written. He who says that he knows me and does not keep his commandments is a liar. Wow. He's a liar. And, not a, and, uh, and worse than that, he says, and the truth is not in him. That's sad because now we're talking about the truth, meaning the presence of Jesus Christ. It's, it, you know, Jesus Christ is not the one who has controlling influence in my life. If I say I know him and I don't keep his commandments, 
Jesus Christ is not primary or priority in my life. In fact, the truth is not in me. That word, word, the word of God is the truth. The spirit of God is the truth. And if the spirit of God is in me, Jesus, uh, Paul said over in, in, in Romans, you know, chapter 8, he says, look, he who does not have the spirit of God is none of, is none of mine. He's not mine. You don't belong to me if you don't have the spirit of God. So he says walking in the spirit is, is truth and walking in the spirit is love. Walking in darkness is lies and it's, and it's hatred. So who, you know, so do we have the spirit of God in us? And if we do, then it should be evident. Romans 8 and verse 9. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Romans 8 and verse 9. And then we go to verse 5, and he says here, he says, But whoever keeps my word or keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. How do we know that we're in him? If we keep his word. Perfected. And by keeping his word, that is evidence that the love of God is perfected. That means it's mature. It's matured in him. And we know that we reach maturity when we obey. That's an evidence of maturity in Christ Jesus. If we obey. Hmm. In 1 John 4 and 20, he, it, it says this. If someone says, I love God mm, and hates his brother, he is a liar. He's a liar. And then we go on to verse 6. Gives us our second he who says. He said, he who says that he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So now we're talking about not just knowing him, but we're talking about actually dwelling in him, living in him, living through him, him living through us. And that's amazing because now we're talking about how do we live? Well, we're, we're asked to live by following Jesus Christ. Abides in him. That abiding means, uh, that abiding means ha uh, having habitual obedience, settling in him, resting in Christ, to dwell in Christ, that permanent abode of being in Christ Jesus. John 8 and 31 says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. <laughs> indeed, that means in not just in word, but you are also in the way you walk. We're fruitful when we abide in him. And we can't do anything uh, uh, apart from him. But if we abide in him, we are very, very fruitful, as it tells us over in John chapter 15, when he says, I am the true vine. You are the branches. Apart from me, you can't do nothing. But with me, if you abide in me, if you're connected with me, then you can do all things. So we can't even live fruitful lives unless we abide in Jesus Christ. The fruit of the Spirit can only happen because the fruit of the Spirit is in us. The love and joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the faithfulness, the goodness, the kindness. The meekness, the self-control, all those things happen because of the word abiding or the spirit abiding in us and we abiding in him. So when, so when he says abide, that means, and he says if you, if you abide in me, he says he who abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Now we're talking about following him and following him means to imitate him. We got to imitate him. If we're Christians, then we should imitate the ones that we believe in, the one that we're disciples of. We believe in Jesus Christ, then we should be walking like Jesus Christ. The disciples, they were glad when people would talk about them as being like Jesus, even if it meant that they would be, have to suffer uh, persecution. They thought that was the best thing in the world. Wow, I can suffer persecution for the name of Jesus? For them, that was the best thing in the world, 
to be identified with Jesus. And it should be for us to be identified with Jesus. Not that I'm saying that you should go out looking to be persecuted or looking to have to suffer physical suffering under somebody's hand. Not looking for that. But what I'm saying is that if someone identifies us as being a Christian because of what they see in our lives, that should be wonderful. So even as we were talking on Wednesday night and John was talking about being, you know, being that, living that, nor, that narrow life and, and, and how Christians are, are, are seen as being narrow-minded, and that's fine that we're seen as being narrow-minded, but we should not take that as an insult. Why do we take being narrow-minded as an insult? The Bible says that it's the narrow way that leads to life. It's the broad road that leads to destruction. So it should be a compliment, as we've said many times here. It should be a compliment when somebody says, you're narrow-minded. Thank God. Thank God. I don't want to be broad-minded. So we walk as he walked, or he lives as he lives, as followers of Jesus. We should endeavor to do just that. And we should do it with a willing desire to do it, not because we feel obligated to do it. Follow me in John 10, 27. Jesus said, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. They imitate me. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. Paul said, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. As I imitate Christ. And I'm glad Paul didn't just leave it at imitate me. I'm glad he didn't just leave it there. But he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Christ. When we see things in Paul that is not Christ-like, we don't imitate that, just like anybody else that is important in your life that you consider to be an example. When you see things that are not Christian-like in that person's life, you don't imitate that. It's as I follow him. Ephesians 5 and 1 says, be imitators of God as dear children. We should be imitators as God. And in and, and Colossians 2 and 6, he says, as you therefore have received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. <laughs> At this point. Then in verse 7, praise and worship team, you can come up. At this point, we're about to come in for a landing. In verse 7, he says, brother, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. The word which you heard from the beginning. That beginning that they're talking about is the, uh, the, the word that you heard from the, from, from the time you first heard the gospel. From the beginning of your Christian life, the, the gospel that was preached to you. That word is the commandment that you're hearing now. It's the same thing. Obey Jesus Christ, obey his word, obey the commandments. And he's even going a little deeper because now he's starting to introduce here the importance of love and the commandment to love. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Verse 8, again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you? Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The old commandment, that old commandment, that, that commandment that Jesus Christ had given to them, he said, it's not a new commandment, it's an old commandment. And he's actually referring to John chapter 13, verse 34, when he says, a new commandment, I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, the interesting thing about this, when you look at this, that commandment is actually taken from back in the Old Testament. And upgrade it, if you will. Back in the Old Testament, back in Leviticus 19 and also Deuteronomy chapter 6, the word that came forth was love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind, your soul, and your strength. Then it also mentions that you love your neighbors as yourself. So that that particular time, loving your neighbors as yourself, was like the highest order of love at that particular time. Because if you love somebody the way you love yourself, you don't hurt yourself, you don't do things against yourself, you don't lie about yourself, you don't do all these crazy, crazy things, right? 
So the highest order of love was to love somebody as you love yourself. But now Jesus says, I write to you a new commandment. And this new commandment says that you love one another, the standard, not as you loved yourself, but as I have loved you. Whoa. That's the new standard of love. To love someone as he loved us. Not the way you love yourself, but the way he loved us. Because that's the highest standard of love. No one has ever loved that much that they would give their life for their brothers. That's the highest standard of love. For us to love like Jesus. And the apostles heard that. They sat under that. But not only that, but they watched him. They watched him love them. They watched him suffer with them. They watched him as he went day to day, and they saw the love. They saw the love. And he says, love one another that way. And that's how we, the church, are being challenged is to love one another the way he loved us, not the way we love ourselves, not the way we think we want to love you. Sometimes we think, well, I can love you to this point and no further. And <laughs> no further. I ain't going to that point right here. This is where our love stops. If it comes to be inconvenient, I can't love you to that point. If it comes to mean that i got to deny something about myself, I can't love you to that point. If it means that it's not going to benefit me, I can't love you to that point. But if we love the way he loved us, then we can love regardless. We can love in spite of. We can love enough to be honest with each other and to call out each other's sin, to share with each other, not because we want to judge but because we care about each other and we say it in love to be there for each other. And yes, even to give our lives, maybe not necessarily in the physical, but in the spiritual, I'm going to forget or I'm going to lay aside these feelings that I have about what happened and I'm going to forgive. I'm going to ask God to come in and help me to forgive. Why? Because Christ died for us, not when we got it all together, but while we were yet sinners. He didn't wait till we got cleaned up. He didn't wait till we changed. He died for us while we were yet sinners. Can we do that for each other? While someone is yet acting messed up, can we still love them? I know that you offended me. I know that you did something behind my back. But I'm still going to do just like Jesus and kneel down and wash your feet. Even though I know you betrayed me. Can we do that? That's loving as you love. As he loved us. It's a high order. And we need the Holy Spirit to help us to do that. Because in and ourselves, we can't do that. I can't. I get offended. I get offended. My feelings can get hurt. I can be very sensitive sometimes. I can be self-centered sometimes. But the scripture says I should esteem others higher than myself. But of myself, I can't do that. I need the Holy Spirit in me to help me to be more like Jesus. And we all do. And that's what we should be crying out for. That's what we should be praying for. For ourselves and for each other. Make us more like Jesus. He says, I write this thing to you, which is true in you. It was true in him. It was definitely true in Jesus. That high order of love is true in him, but it's also in you because the darkness is passing away. We are in Christ Jesus now, and that stuff that was in our hearts before we got to him, before we gave our hearts to him, 
before he came into us, our hearts to live within us, before we got there, that stuff should be passing away. That's darkness. Jesus is light. So when we let Jesus into our hearts, we are letting light into our hearts. And his word should now be the authority in our lives. His way should be the authority in our lives. And that's light. That's light. So the darkness is passing in the way, a passing away, and the true light is already shining. I have a niece in, in closing here. I have a niece, a cousin actually. She's not a niece. She was younger. I used to call her my niece, but she was actually a cousin. And I remember when she first got saved. And she was a sweet girl. Even growing up, she was a sweet girl. She was always very sweet. But she had a mean streak, a serious mean streak. And if you got on her bad side, that could be ugly. But I remember when she got saved and she came back home from college. And I remember just seeing her walk through the door in this glow that was all over her because she was walking with Christ. And it was just a glow all over her. I mean, it was just, it was amazing. And this great big smile that never left her face for like a week. The smile was on her face every time I saw her. And all she talked about was love. Loving. Loving this person. Loving that person. Loving. That's all she talked about. There was such a change in her life. And you could see it. And I thought about that as I was studying through this when it talks about the light is already shining. And that's the way it should be in us. The light of Jesus Christ should be shining in us. When we walk into a, a dark place or we walk among people that are walking in sin and their lives are dark, this light that's in us through Christ Jesus should be shining because we abide in him, because we know him. And then next time we're going to see what it means about when he says, he who is in the light. So, in closing, I just want to say that Jesus brought the light when he came into the world. He came as light. And his life, his own life, was the light. If you go back and read John 1, it talks about his life being the light. It wasn't that he walked around with some bright light saying, hey, Jesus here, I'm Jesus. Yep, I'm the Messiah. I'm God with you. He didn't have to do that. His life, his life showed that. People were around him, didn't have to be around him a long time to see that there was something different about him. And I'm sure it's that way with you, many of you. When you're in the company of a multitude of people, people can see that there's something different about you. There's a light that's shining on the inside of you that people can see. Even people, especially people who are walking in darkness, because you're contrary to what they see and what they know. And Jesus sacrificed himself to come and bring us that light and that life. And I'm grateful for that. So as we get ready for communion here, I just want to say to you that we should be always endeavoring to walk in the light and to be obedient to the word of God through the help of the Holy Spirit because of what was sacrificed for us to have it, for us to have this reconciliation that we now have with the Father. So much was given for that, so much. So we should walk in obedience to him and remember him and honor him for what he's done as he has brought light and life into our, our life. We were sitting in darkness, but he dawned a new light in our lives. Thank God. So on a night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this 
is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup. And after supper, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, in the blood that he shed that we could now have upon us that makes intercession for our sins when we confess our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Uh, this blood that washed us clean. Jesus paid it all, brother. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow in the blood of Jesus. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood for the shedding of sins, the blood that was spilled for the shedding of sins, the forgiveness of sins the remission of sins for all. Drink this, and as often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this blood, we do proclaim the death of the Lord until he come. Father, I pray that your heart has been shown. I pray that we can now, Lord, come to you and confess to you those things that we need to confess and that we can come in under, un, uh, under obedience of your commandments. For those of you who would like to come up and share with the Lord, no one else needs to know what those things are that you want to give to him. Those of you who want to come up, please come. And come to the altar and share those things that we need to confess. If you desire to walk closer with him, if you desire to abide more closer with him, if you desire to walk in the light, if you desire to know him more, come on up. Share it with him. He desires to hear it. He desires to know it. If we want to strengthen our relationship, Lord will be there for us. Arms to walk away from him. Come on up. The Lord will be there for us. Arms wide open.